And here we are, for real this time, Pastor Mike Online today. I am live with you right now, and I think everything's working okay. Not sure exactly what was going on with that, but we made it through it, and we are online with you today. I want you, I want to, I'm playing that song. Uh, we always play a song before our broadcast. I like it. I, this is one of my favorites, uh, This Old House. And um, it, it made me think of 2 Corinthians 5, and this is, has a lot to do with some things we're going to talk about today. Um, I started out a while ago when we were having problems talking about be not deceived. I want you to look that up in your King James Bible. I want you to look at the phrase, be not deceived. Five times you'll find it in there. And, um, and I'm sure there are other variances of that in the Scriptures. But in 2 Corinthians 5, I want you to listen to this. Um, is it, well, I won't, even, I won't even ask this question. I was going to ask the question, is it wrong for us to try to maintain a healthy body? I, don't, I think the answer is, no, it's not wrong to try to maintain a healthy body. But is there a limit? Is there a limit? At what point do we as Bible-believing Christians draw back and say, um, I'm going to be better off in heaven than I am right here. Let me explain to you what I'm, what I'm saying. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I've got some news articles I'm going to read. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, that was the song, this old house once to my children. We know that if, if our earthly house of this tabernacle we're dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If you lose this one, you're going to get another one waiting for you in the heavens. It's eternal. It's not going to give out on you like the ones we have right now. For in this we groan, um, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. I just read yesterday um, a passage of Scripture where Jehu went in to the temple of Baal, and he said, Every, he said, who at all here is a Baal worshiper? And they all said, yeah, we are. We're Baal worshipers. He said, get your Baal suits on. I want everybody that worships Baal in here by 12 o'clock. Get your Baal suits on. Get your Baal vestments on. Put your Baal, your Baal t-shirts on. Everybody dress like you're ready to worship Baal, and they all did. And Jehu went outside of the temple and gathered an army. He said, go in there and kill everybody that's got Baal shirts on. And that's what he did. I paraphrased a lot of that. You know that, don't you? But that's what, he, that's what happened. We are clothed right now with mortality. And I want you to think about how true this is. It's not just some uh, mystical thought that we have. Oh, I, I can see myself wearing, wearing this earthly clothing. That's not how it is. The Bible means exactly what it says. Our soul is wearing this body. And this body is corrupt. And we are literally wearing tattered clothing in our, in our souls are wearing tattered clothing. We desire to be clothed upon um, with our house, which is from heaven. And just think about it. It's a covering. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened. Usually about every morning. When I wake up, I groan. <sighs> My wife, the clock can go off and she'll spring up right out of bed. I have no idea how she does that. If I spring up out of bed when my clock went off, I would fall forward. I would get up. I would bounce into everything between me and our bathroom. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but anyway... We groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. 
I like that. Think about things that swallow up. Death swallowed up in victory. A great whale swallowed up Jonah. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then he says, uh, he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And I just, uh, I, I'm just asking you a question. How bad is it if we die? If we are true Bible believers, we believe and trust in the living word of God, how bad is it if we die or if we find out we are going to die? The doctor pulls his glasses off and says, I'm going to be frank with you. And you say, well, I thought your name was Charlie, but go ahead and be frank if you want. And the doctor says, you've got six months to live. Okay? Now, that's something we, we, we would all dread. Don't get me wrong. Death stings. There's no doubt about it. But how bad is it? If mortality takes its course and our soul is going to change garments, it's going to go from being clothed upon with mortality, which is death, to being clothed upon with immortality, which is everlasting life. Is it okay to maintain the body that we have? I, I believe so. I'm doing my best. To maintain my body, uh, it's like some guy said. I'm, um, I'm maintaining my figure. A circle is a figure, and that's what I have. Uh, I still don't have any sound effects. I haven't got my iPad back yet. But ha- is it okay to maintain our body? And yes, bodily ex- bodily exercise. The Bible says profiteth. It profiteth little, but it profiteth. It does us some good. Walking treadmills, lifting weights, doing things like that, watching what you eat, how you eat, how fast you eat, how slow you eat, uh, what types of food you eat, and so on. I am all for that. Taking uh, prescribed medications. I'm not against that in most cases. I didn't say all, but in most cases, I'm not against taking a doctor's prescription. I must take medicine every day in order to maintain I'm not I my body does produce some insulin not like it used to and my cells don't take in what they used to take in so I take some medicine that helps produce some more insulin and then helps the insulin to work the way it's supposed to do. I take this medicine every day. Not against that. It's it's not... uh, Some people use this thing out of the book Revelation where it talks about sorcery, and they say that's pharmakia and that's pharmaceuticals, and you shouldn't shouldn't take any medicines. That is not true. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And the Bible's telling you that medicine does good, most of it, not all of it. But here's, here's where I'm getting at. We are rapidly approaching a day when health care in this world is going to advance in such a way that it's not just the common medicine that you and I are used to taking. Maybe you take something for your blood pressure. Maybe you take something for diabetes. Maybe you take something um, maybe that helps your hormonal balance, so on. All kind, your heart, things that you take for your heart, and so on. Maybe you take things like that. They're probably doing you some good. And if they weren't doing any good, you'd go back to the doctor and say, this is nothing. It's not working. I need something else. So you try something else. But here's what's going on. They're going to advance to a place where it's not just going to be a combination of chemicals balanced in the right way that's the pill that you're going to take. They're going to do, they're going to be able to go into your body at the molecular level and the cellular level 
taking your DNA and rewriting it, recoding your DNA, changing who and what you are at a foundational level. And, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about why this is wrong today, and along with some other things. Anytime we talk about DNA, we talk about the book, in thy book, Psalm 139, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. And so the book of my body is my DNA. God wrote it in a specific way. God said, you cannot add to it. You cannot take things out of it. You cannot re, I will not purposely let anybody reprogram my DNA. I won't do it. It's not going to happen. I'm going to leave it the way God wrote it because I trust God more than I trust medicine or anybody else in this world. I trust God. And anytime we talk about DNA and talk about a book, we also make that same analogy to my, my life in Jesus Christ, or let's say our ministry, or let's say our church or denomination, because those two are bodies, and those bodies are designed by a book, and that book is the Holy Bible. And we need to be careful about, remember that song we used to sing, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear? Remember that? We got to be careful. Let me read some articles. Let me tell you where I'm going with all this. This this one jumped out. This one just came through. Um, it was I found it on Drudge Report just about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes ago. An Australian health blogger admits lying about cancer. Now, again, I I'm not the biggest health food junkie. I'm not. Um, I don't, I don't, um, I don't try to dissuade people from trying natural herbal homeopathic remedies. I don't try to dissuade people from that at all. I think some of them probably do some good modern medicine and compounding and, and putting things together goes all the way back to ancient times where people were taking roots and leaves and seeds and oils and mixing them together and compounding them and giving them to people. Balms and medicines and things like that were taken by people for thousands of years. So I couldn't be critical of it at all. But what I've been critical of is some of the health and wellness websites, number one, that are based on New Age doctrines and New Age principles. I am against that 100%. Um, I, uh, every now and then, would get sent articles by this guy called, he calls himself the Health Ranger. And every now and then, he, he runs a blog and he reports, you know, health and medical things that are going on. And he tries to prove that pharmaceutical companies are out to kill us all and that doctors are all evil and this and that and the other. And he only takes this and he swallows this and so on. And But if you read his articles, he is new age to the core. And it kind of makes you ask the question, when you, when you start reading his website or others like it, and you start reading what they're saying and how they're talking about this root will release healing energies in you. You have to ask the question, where does it say in my Bible that my body has healing energies that are locked up? It doesn't. This is a new age or a new age concept, and you need to be careful about that. So number one, these health and holistic healing websites that are based on new age principles, I think you ought to stay away from them. And it's some people say, well, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, in some cases, there's not even a baby in there. Throw it out. Get rid of it. Then you have, you have health bloggers that make ridiculous claims about certain remedies um, I remember being introduced several years ago to this thing called the Miracle 2 Soap. Some of you may have heard that. And I was, I was being introduced to this stuff by someone who was a Christian. And they were telling me, you got to try this soap. 
Where did it come from? Well, it's eloptically made. And I'm going, what, what is eloptically? Never heard that word before. This guy made up a word. This guy mixed together this soap that he said God gave him the formula by writing it on the wall. He wrote the, the formula of how to make this soap on the wall, and in the cassette tape that someone gave me to listen to, he claimed that this soap would cure cancer. He lied. And why did he lie? What compelled him to lie? He was selling soap. That was his compulsion to lie. That was his, his driving um, mechanism to, to get the soap in your hands. He wanted to make money off of you. And so he said the soap will cure cancer. It'll cure Alzheimer's. It will relieve your arthritis. It will do all of these things. It was a bar of soap for crying out loud. And he said it was eloptically manufactured, and no one knew what that meant. Here is the Austra Australian health blogger admits lying about cancer. Um, this is from Sydney, Australia, uh, 32 Wallaby Way, Sydney. An Australia blogger who found fame after claiming she was conquering brain cancer through natural therapy. Her app even getting chosen for the new Apple Watch admitted Thursday she never had the disease. Belle Gibson launched her successful The Whole Pantry business in 2013, billed as the world's first health, wellness, and lifestyle app community on the back of healing herself naturally through whole foods and alternative therapies. She also released the Whole Pantry Cookbook in 2014, which publisher Penguin pulled from sale last month when suspicions sparked by the Australian media first arose. It had been due to go on sale soon in the United States and Great Britain for its new smartwatch, which goes on sale Friday. Um, the mother of one, Gibson, 23, has now admitted she fabricated the cancer when quizzed by the Australian Women's Weekly magazine. No, none of it is true, she confessed in an interview published Thursday entitled My Lifelong Struggle with the Truth. I just think speaking out was the responsible thing to do. Above anything else, I want people to say, okay, she's human. Gibson added that after years of lies, confronting the truth was very scary, to be honest. Reports said she had received hate mail and even death threats since being exposed. She said the backlash had been beyond horrible. Reports said that, um, no, wait a minute, Gibson did not go into detail about her motivations for lying. I know what her motivation for lying was. I get it. It was money. It was Australian money, but it was money. That was her motivation for lying. Um, she's not going into detail about the motivation for lying other than that she had a troubled childhood. What has that got to do with getting this app and creating this website and all of this stuff that she did and all the money that she raked in and the cookbook? You don't blame that on a bad childhood. You don't say, all right. My dad hated me. That's why I did it. That's not, I don't believe that. Um, the magazine said accountants were winding up the whole pantry business. Gibson's lie began unraveling when it emerged last month that she failed to donate 300,000 Australian dollars in profits from the sales of her book to charity as promised, and friends started questioning her diagnosis via the media. Consumer Affairs Authority said they were checking whether she had breached any laws and claiming to give to charity when the money had not been donated. Businesses are obliged to ensure that any representations related to their products or services do not mislead consumers, and all representations are true and accurate, Consumer Affairs Victoria said in a statement. Todd Harper, the chief of uh, local charity Cancer Council Victoria, urged patients to be wary of cure claims that sounded too good to be true. Gibson said, um, we are very concerned about anyone who makes unproven, scientifically flawed claims about cancer treatments because the risk is that cancer patients will take them seriously, he said. 
He added that patients should consult their doctor before trying alternative or complementary treatments, including extreme diets. Bloggers faking disease and even death to gain attention is not a new phenomenon. Earlier this month, a 27-year-old U.S. woman from New York State was jailed for 20 years after killing her 5-year-old son by poisoning him with salt so she could log on and write about his illness. The court heard Lacey Spears suffered from Munchausen syndrome. Uh, if you don't know what that is, um, it was called Munchausen syndrome by proxy. In other words, you fake, you have a child, you fake the child's illness. You're the one making the child sick. And it's constantly getting the child's attention by medical health care professionals and hospitals and so on. And you look like the savior mother who's trying to save your child's life, but you're the one killing the kid or making the kid sick. And it's a legitimate psychiatric disease. Um, the Australian Woman's Weekly said medical specialists uh, it spoke to suggested Gibson could be suffering from a similar condition. But the thing is, she lied. She, she built a business of selling holistic, whole body health supplements, including a cookbook and an app that's, that is supposed to be on the Apple Watch. And big money here. And it was all based upon her story of how she cured herself from cancer. And you, ask, you have to ask the question, how many people believed her? In the hundreds of thousands, apparently. Hundreds of thousands of people believed her story, and she lied out of her teeth is what she did. So here's, here's what we're going to do. Let's go back to our King James Bible. Be not deceived. Five times. Deuteronomy 11, 16, first place this is found. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And I'm telling you that at the heart of some of these health blogs is a worship of other gods through the New Age movement. That's at the heart of it. Be not deceived by this stuff. Don't fall for it. If you can't find it in your Bible, it doesn't exist. It's as simple as that. Um, Luke 21.8, and he said, listen to this one. Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. That, again, is at the heart of newage teaching is that we will all attain the Christ consciousness and we will be gods and we will be able to we will have no more diseases and we'll never die anymore we're going to escape mortality and it's not going to happen and he said be not deceived by this 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He goes on and talks about these things. Uh, he said, They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This is what provoked me to this. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And I want you to think about words and the power that words have. We always like to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never harm me. And that is not true. We know it's not true. You and I have the power to say things to people to either put them in a good mood or a really, really, really bad mood. We have that ability. And most of the time, it's done purposely. Sometimes it's done innocently. I have offended people in, with what I thought was just innocent comments. You know me, I'm always trying to be funny, trying to crack a little joke to kind of break up the tension. And I have said the wrong thing, and I have offended people, and I've had to apologize to people who were in tears over what I said. We have that ability. And I want you to think about words being targeted at us. And Paul saying, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good 
manners. Now, he's not talking about wiping your mouth with a napkin and don't put your elbows on the table and the salad fork goes to the left and the soup spoon goes. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the manners and the lifestyles that you and I are supposed to live in Jesus Christ a way that you and I are to conduct ourselves, a way that we are to believe, a way that we are to think, a way that we interact with other people, the way we treat other people, the way we believe about politics and how we react to things that are going on in this world politically, the, the way we're supposed to react to things that are not true, like false doctrine and things like that. And he's telling us, be not deceived, because evil communications will corrupt Good manners. I um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play it today. But if you go to Facebook.com/slash Pastor Mike Online, I I put a uh, link up there, uh, and some people just sent me this in an email. A link there of Creflo the Dollar, and he's he. If you remember, here a while back, he put up a, a thing on his website saying. Please help me. I need thirty-five million dollars to buy a new plane. And he put that up there. And the the outcry against him, he, people were making fun of him. So it was kind of going bad for him, so he took it down. He then gets up in front of his church, and there's a link to this video. He gets up in front of his church, and he tells everybody, of course I need a plane. I need a plane. I got to go preach me the gospel. And he, he even talks about, good grief, he even talks about, he said, if they find life on Mars then I'm going to go up there with a billion-dollar rocket ship, and I'm going to preach the gospel to them up there on Mars. That's, that's what he said. And then he, gets, and then he says to his, to his church that people accused him of asking members to donate for his new plane. He said, I never did ask y'all members. He said he never asked. Well, somebody had saved his website in an Internet archive and his website that he took down, you go see it. He specifically asks members to help him buy a new plane. And he lied through his teeth. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Do we, do we believe this verse? Do we believe what it says? Do we believe that people can be taken in by the lies that are in healthcare websites. Whether they are natural herbal remedy websites or pharmaceutical company websites, do those pharmaceutical companies, have they ever lied about their product? Have they ever, oh, I don't know, skewed the data of of test results and experimental trials have they ever have they ever buried or hidden results that didn't favor them and they were trying to get a drug out to the market and they they wanted FDA approval and so they hid certain facts from the Food and Drug Administration or maybe somebody from the FDA all of a sudden now he's driving a brand new Lexus back and forth to work every day Does that happen? There's no doubt in my mind about it. So the lies come from both sides. Who do you believe? You're just going to have to trust God. You're going to have to trust God. And by the way, everybody is capable of evil communications, including me, including you. So here's here's something to just kind of keep in mind. And I know that it's not possible to go around and talk Bible verses in every conversation with everything that you say. It's not possible. It's not feasible. Hey, Brother Mike, how you doing today? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, it just it doesn't really answer the question. But the best way to not lie is to quote Scripture. That's the best way in the world, to not lie. Preachers best way to not lie is to just quote Bible verses and tell what the Bible says. 
Anyway, we can be deceived by evil communications. Do um, Does Lady Gaga and Katy Perry and Rihanna and what are some of these other, I don't even know the names anymore. Do these people tell the truth in the lyrics of their songs? When Katy Perry's getting up talking about, uh, baby, you're a firework, you've got this spark in you and it's ready to ignite, is that is that something that's true according to the Bible? No, absolutely not. She's teaching Kabbalah mysticism. She's, teach, she's teaching and building up the religion of the Antichrist. That's what she's doing. That's what that song's all about. I, I dealt with this, I don't know, a couple years ago in a Pastor Mike online. Somebody wanted me to watch the, the video of firework from Katy Perry because there was two guys kissing in there. And I'm watching, I didn't listen to the song. I was watching the, the scenery in the video. I'd heard this song before, didn't know what it was about. And all of a sudden I can see this is about the divine spark in everybody and how it's going to come out full-blown divinity. And now everybody's going to be equal and everybody's going to be a God. And this is going to bring in the new age and everybody's going to be happy. And the Christ consciousness is going to take over. And that's what it was all about. And evil communications are corrupting good manners. How, I have been seeing this for years. How church families, church families, have no restrictions whatsoever upon their teenagers or their children as far as what they listen to on their iPod or their iPhone or their tablet or their computer or their laptop or whatever. They have no restrictions whatsoever upon what their children listen to. And I don't listen very much if at all, to the pop music, the top 40 stuff out there. I don't listen. I don't sit around and listen to what's being said. Every now and then, somebody will send something my way or I'll hear something and I'll just go, I don't believe this. I was at a basketball game with with Caleb, high school basketball game, and as the team came out on the uh, court and they were warming up, they were playing this song. And I can't remember the I can't remember what it was, but I could hear the the chorus. It was like a rap song, and I could hear a repeated phrase in there. So I pulled my phone out, went to Google, and typed it in. And I'm looking at the lyrics, and I'm going, "Oh my goodness!" They were there was I want I want him. It was bad. And parents, church parents, have no concern whatsoever about what their children are listening to. So here's their daughter in there listening to Justin Bieber, and then she's listening to Katy Perry tell her that she kissed a girl and liked it. And the family going to church, they don't know it, but their daughter is turning out to be a bisexual or a lesbian. And they wonder how that happened. Evil communications corrupted good manners. I talked to Dave Benoit. Some of you might remember him. He doesn't really do a lot of this anymore, but back in the 90s and the 80s, uh, he was going around doing seminars on rock music, seminars on um, the occult and witchcraft and Harry Potter and all this stuff. I had him come to Bethel several years ago, and I said, Dave, let me ask you a question. I said, you used to do a lot of stuff on rock and roll. And he said, yeah. He said, um, he said, a couple things happened. He said, I, I just don't do it anymore. And he said, a couple things happened. Number one, rock and roll music, top 40, pop, metal, rap, rhythm, whatever, whatever kind of music it is. He said, number one, it's gotten so vulgar, openly vulgar, that he said, I can't really play examples in the church or I can't really... Uh, give out the lyrics because they're so vile and filthy and vulgar. He said it just wouldn't be appropriate. And he said, number two, most churches have gone over to a rock and roll type service and they don't call me anymore to have me do a rock and roll seminar. They don't do it. Be not deceived, people. Evil communications will corrupt good manners. By the way, this last one, Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever, listen to this now. I want you to think about that. Whatsoever a man soweth, 
that shall he also reap. And I want you to think of seed, DNA. I want you to think of that. Seed is DNA, and it's sown by various means. The Word of God is seed, and it was sown into us either by us reading the Word of God or someone preaching the Word of God. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, you're, since we're made out of dirt, we are like a field. That's what the Bible's telling us, what the parable of the seed and the sower was all about. I am this piece of ground, because I'm literally made out of the ground. And so, lo and behold, here comes a preacher, and he preaches a message, and the seed goes into my heart, into my thinking, and it takes root. And it begins to do exactly the way God designed it. Boy, I'll tell you what, I'm thankful for that. And so, when God sows his word into us, he doesn't say, hey, open your mouth, let me drop this seed in there. He doesn't do that. He speaks his word to us, and we receive it. So think about it. Think about bad seed and what you sow, you are going to, and he said, be not deceived, for whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. Let me read to you a story. Let's see here. I got a couple genetic ones here. Cancer tech reprogramming rogue cells in pancreatic cancers. All forms of pancreatic cancer are difficult to treat. Surgery is the only potential solution for the rare neuroendocrine variety, the type that Steve Jobs succumbed to. And we all know how ineffective that method still is. Adenocarcinoma. I'm surprised I said that right. Adeno, adenocarcinoma. The more common variety that killed the likes of Patrick Swayze and Luciano Pavarotti is no better a sentence as anyone who does their own supermarket shopping knows from seeing the tabloids. Most cases of, let me skip down here. Researchers at the Sanford Burnham Institute in San Diego have now figured out a way to reprogram these rogue ductal cells back into obedient asinar cells. I have no idea what that is. The way they did this was to overexpress a single master control gene simply known as E47 in an adenocarcinoma cell line obtained from mice. When they reintroduced the cells now carrying megaloads of the E47 back into the mouse pancreas, they reverted back to the docile asinar cell type. Technically speaking, if you recall your high school biology, the cells were said to be stalled in the GOG1 growth phase of the putative cell cycle. You know what? I do remember that from high school biology. Not! have no idea what this is talking about. But here, what this is talking about is reprogramming DNA. Reprogram. You know what that is. That's rewriting it. Taking what's there and making an alteration to it. Taking words out of DNA and adding words in to DNA. That's, that's reprogramming. Now, I mentioned this article, this next one. I mentioned it uh, when I was down in Harrison, Arkansas. I've talked about it uh, last week, I think, on Pastor Mike Online as something that was coming up. It was an unreleased paper, but now it's been released. And here's, here's the story. Chinese scientists genetically modify, not cancer cells, not viruses. They genetically modify human embryos. If you don't know what that is, I'll give you a little left lesson here. This, this, here's dad. Here's mom. 23 chromosomes here, 23 chromosomes here. They mix them together. And so now inside of the woman is this little circle. It's got goo in it, but in that goo is 46 chromosomes. It's a rolled-up book 
and it's rolled around these these little rods called histones, and they all look like a cross. All right. So in this this one cell, that is called an embryo. That is when a a child is in is in its embryonic stage. When they hear them, when you hear them talk about embryonic stem cells, they're talking about a child inside of a woman's womb, or in some cases, and this this really, if you you, you got to think about this, they have human babies in petri dishes and test tubes, and they think nothing of it. And I guess this is you know, 40, 50 years of the generation that says, yeah, we can abort babies. It's no big deal. They're not human anyway. They're not human until, I don't know, they're like in fourth or fifth grade, something like that. These genetic scientists have fertilized human embryos in a test tube, and they experiment on them, and then when they're done with the experiment, they destroy it. That's murder. That's, that's murder is what it is. You're murdering this child. Well, it's not a child. It's just a little embryo. That's a child. God is the one who forms that in the womb. That is as much alive as every part of my body is right now. It's alive, and it's a child, and it's murder. To either destroy it in the petri dish or to destroy it in the woman's womb. That's that's what I believe the Bible's teaching us. Um, John the Baptist was full of the Holy Spirit while he was inside his mother's womb. Uh, anyway, Chinese sen- sen- scientists genetically modify human embryos. So here's these here's these this circle, and it, I'm over exaggerating its size. Okay, because it's way smaller than this. But it has the book of life in it, DNA. And so the I guess the holy grail of genetic manipulation has just been performed by Chinese scientists. Human embryos are at the center of a debate over the ethics of gene editing. Um In a world first, Chinese scientists have reported editing the genes of human embryos. The results are published in the online journal uh, Protein and Cell and confirm widespread rumors that such experiments had been conducted. Rumors that sparked a high-profile debate last month about the ethical implications of such work. And here's what's funny, and I say that in a sarcastic, sarcastic way, what's What's weird or wrong about all of this is that, yes, they will talk about the ethical implications and the moral implications, and there will be debates over this, but it's never stopped a scientist from doing what he or she wants to do. There's always, once you open, I'm going to use something out of mythology here. Once you open Pandora's box, there's no way to get everything back in there. It's kind of the Bible illustration is trying to trying to pick up water that's been spilled. It's impossible. You cannot if you pour water, if you spill your soda drink out at the picnic in the grass, you'll never be able to get that soda back in the cup. That's the Bible illustration, and that's what's going on here. Once one person figures out how to do this, it doesn't matter what country outlaws it. It doesn't matter what uh, ethical or moral implications it has. Once one person knows how to do this, it's going to be done. And they're trying to tell us, well, you know, they, they, they worked on it. They did the embryos. They rewrote the DNA. They reprogrammed it. But then, they, see, they don't allow this thing to grow inside of a woman. And if you believe that, that they don't let it grow inside of a woman, if you believe that, you'll have to believe that they didn't let it grow inside of a woman today. But tomorrow or next week or next year, it's going to happen. Several years ago, Great Britain was debating about how to deal with 
children who have more than two biological parents. Now they are dealing with children who have more than two biological parents. It doesn't matter if you outlawed or not. It's going to happen. In the paper, researchers led by Jinju Huang, a gene function researcher at Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou, tried to head off such concerns by using not, and I don't know what I just ordered from the Chinese restaurant, but anyway, tried to head off such concerns by using non-viable embryos, which cannot result in a live birth, that were obtained from local fertility clinics. The team attempted to modify the gene responsible for beta thalassemia, a potentially fatal blood disorder, using a gene editing technique known as CRISPR-Cas9. We've talked about that. The researchers say that their results reveal serious obstacles to using the method in medical applications. Um, here's, so here's where this is going. And the, the article goes on to talk about ethical questions and blah, 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 about how this might not be a good idea. And once they figure it out, like I said, once now that they know how to do it, they're going to keep doing it. They're going to do it some more. They're going to do it some more. And they say, well, you know, we're not letting it grow inside of a human woman today. But they will. They absolutely will. And I want you to, I want you to get this, okay? Let's say, let's just pretend for a minute. Let's pretend that there was a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Let's pretend that this woman, Margaret Sanger, did not like black people, Hispanic people, Indian people, Oriental people, Jewish people. She did not like them. She thought they were inferior races to her exalted white Caucasian race. So let's pretend that she decided she wanted to do something about it. She wrote books and pamphlets about how they needed to curb the reproduction rate amongst blacks and Jews and Hispanics and Asians and, and so on and so on. And let's just pretend now that she actually formed an organization that was designed to do one thing, and that is to make sure that the population increase amongst blacks and Latinos and all these other races that she felt was inferior to her, that they have, a, have like an organization that tries to reduce their population growth. And let's, let's just pretend that she called it something like uh, Planned Parenthood. Well, she did. Every bit of that of what I just told you is true. The whole purpose of Planned Parenthood was to try to limit the numbers of the population of races that she felt were inferior to her white Caucasian race. Sounds a little bit like Adolf Hitler, doesn't it? Hillary Clinton said, Margaret Sanger is my hero. Oh, I love Margaret Sanger. She did. If I was if I was black in this country and I found out that the Democratic candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, regarded as a hero a woman who spent her life hating my race, I would never vote for another Democrat as long as I lived. And I, I don't understand the thinking of voting for a president or a congressman who supports Planned Parenthood because their primary goal and target is blacks and Hispanics in this country. Because the, the leader of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, felt that they were inferior races and all they did was sit around and breed. And that's what she believed in. So now, now, so now we have abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood clinics all over the country killing babies for whatever reason. And most of the country doesn't care because if most of the country cared we could do something about this but most of the country doesn't care and i i even know of families who would go to church who have gone to church 
and who have said this is this is murder and we don't support this, they will vote for liberal Democratic candidates. And when a pregnancy came up in that family, they had an abortion. It's just convenient that way. Now we're in the 21st century. Now, in, instead of instead of um, trying to kill them before they're born, now we're we're entering into an age where any genetic trait that the Illuminati people, the Illuminated ones, the aristocratic educated people of the world, any genetic trait that they find undesirable, they can just change it and make it into whatever they want. And I want you to think about how staggering this is now. Because here we are, we're dealing with with children who have more than two biological parents. Now we're looking at children who, let's say, mommy and daddy, 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, added together, put them together. Now there's 46 chromosomes. 23 came from daddy, 23 came from mommy. But they went in and edited the genetic structure of that child, and you have to ask the question, Who's the daddy? Who's the mommy? Because now there's going to be genetic traits in that child that didn't come from either one of them. Legally, legally, they now have a serious problem. Legally. And I, don't th- and I can't even wrap my head around the ramifications of this. Here is another article. This is from uh, geneticsthetech.org. Ask a geneticist. And here's the question being asked. Question. Is there any way for a gay couple to have a child that is their own? The answer is not right now, no. To have children, gay couples need to adopt or find a donor of the opposite sex. But this doesn't mean it will always be like this. At some point, perhaps in the next decade or two, I think it's going to come quicker than that. It may be possible. It will. I will say it will be possible for two men or two women to have a baby together. And they are working. And this is being worked on right now as we speak. Whereas before, two men uh, make a baby. Everybody knows that. It's read Genesis chapter 2 for crying out loud. That's not how. Just watch National Geographic. It doesn't happen that way. Now it does. Now it happens that way. Now these two guys, not only are they violating God's version of human love, They're violating that. Now they're violating the very way that God designed for the human race to continue on this planet and every other species. They're violating that way. They will have the ability of two men combining their DNA so that a child born somehow, some way, is the genetic result of these two men. And again, my I cannot even... I cannot even see the ramifications of that. If if I've been telling you all this time that there is going to be a fundamental foundational change in this world that is going to be so so dramatic and so earth-shattering that we cannot even right now conceive of what that is, I think that That is an understatement of what is actually going to happen in this world. And people, it is happening in our lifetime. It is happening right now. And again, this is why I say let's let's look at the Bible with some fresh eyes. Eyes that see the things going on around us. Eyes that I mean think again, let's think about this. 
If you've ever read Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, you go back, he wrote that, what, in the late 60s, early 70s? He writes The Late Great Planet Earth. And, and go back and read that. You're not going to find anything in Hal Lindsey's book about two daddies making a baby or two mommies making a baby or a baby having more than one genetic father or mother or parent donor. There's nothing about that. There's nothing in the late great planet Earth about going into the human embryo in the embryonic stage and rewriting any of that child's DNA so that it, it is born differently than what it was conceived. I want you to, and, and again, we can't even wrap our heads around that, what that is and what it's like and what laws apply to this and what don't. We can't, we can't even, we're trying to play God without having the brains of God is what we're doing. And again, you, you, you don't read that in the late great planet Earth. It was not even conceived of. It was not even thought of 40 years ago. But we're seeing it now. And I'm not trying to bash Hal Lindsey. I don't agree with some things he says. I don't listen to him very much. But my point is, is that a lot of ideas about the end times were developed in days where we didn't know what we know now about what's going on in this world. And I say that we take all this stuff and we don't, again, we don't change the Bible. We go back now to the Bible to see what it really says and look at it with fresh eyes. Here's where I wanted to go today with all of this. The ability of words... The power of words to change human events, to change people, to change how people think, to change how people see the world around them. I remember a young lady um, when I was pastoring out at Richwoods, she, um, she, her and her husband started coming to church. I mean, she came to the Lord, gave her life over to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it wasn't two weeks, and she stood up and testified at our church service. She said, "I, you, you, some of you know me, have known me all my life. It's a small community out there. I didn't never knew her until she started coming to church. And she said, I I used to be pro-abortion. I used to be liberal. I used to you know, think, believe in evolution. She said, I've only been a Christian two weeks. And she said, now I think that killing babies in, the, in a mama's womb is wrong. I think that's murder. And I'm going, I didn't preach that into her. God said that to her. The ability of words to change how people think and change the direction that they go in life and alter their perception about the world around them. The, the ability of words to do that is real, and it's going on right now. One of the things that I'm trying to do with my life and with whatever this microphone that God gave me and so on, I want to be able to change people's minds by way of the Word of God. If you think one way and that thinking is wrong and that thinking is contrary against the Word of God, I want God to use me and to use all of you out there to try to change people's minds and change the direction they're going. Does that make sense to everybody? So I want you to th- I want you to think of now. I got some verses here. I I pulled this up in my Evernote. I I don't remember the initial thought that I had, but this was uh, just a few weeks ago that I I, I must have been sitting somewhere and had this thought, and then I was putting verses in my Evernote thing. And um, I put in, the title was, and this is things that I used to search it with, False Bibles and Salvation, PMO. I knew I was going to talk about it, Pastor Mike, online. False Bibles and Salvation. And I want you to think, I'm going to give you this verse, and I've talked about it before, but 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So let's, let's think about this. Let's look at this, at this passage now with 21st, 20, 21st century, 2015 eyes. Can't look at it with 2016 eyes because between now and next year, the things that we know today will look small compared to what we know this time next year. Guarantee you. I, I'm Here I'm talking about CRISPR and, and the ability to edit DNA in the embryonic stage of the developing child so that the child is born differently than how it's conceived. And we will look at this at, at next year and say, that's old technology. 
that's old. That's that's like Windows 3.1 old, okay? Or Windows, that's Windows 8 old is what we'll do. This verse, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. We know now because we live in the age of genetically modified organisms what this looks like. We know what it looks like. We know how it turns out. And think about what Monsanto and think about what all these other seed companies are doing. What are they doing with the seeds? And why do they call it genetically modified? Because they've taken the DNA, let's say, of a, of a soybean. They take the DNA, the book that God wrote for soybeans. They take that DNA and they find some things in there that they don't like. They find some things in there that actually, in their opinion, inhibit it from producing quickly and, um, and, and producing more. In other, in other words, yielding more seed from this one seed. So they find that in that seed, and they, they figure out how to rewrite it by taking stuff out and adding stuff to it. They're reprogramming the genetic structure, the book of this seed. And then they take that seed and they plant it in the ground. And now instead of it being one seed, now it's, I don't know how many soybeans end up on a plant, but let's say it's, I don't know, 80. Now you have 80 seeds just like that. That's one plant. You've got 600 acres of soybeans planted that all have this new genetic this genetic alteration in it, re, the, rewriting the book. What, what essentially they did was they found, here we go, they found words, they found words in the book of a soybean, and they took those words out, and they put different words in. Did you catch that? Let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 2, God gave seed to Adam. God gave him his word, his covenant. And he essentially said, and this is real cool because if you go back, in fact, let's do this. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, this is the kind of stuff I like. I like this kind of stuff. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, the very words that God spoke to Adam concerning his law, concerning that tree, it's exactly 39 words. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. Starting in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. There's 39 words that came out of God's mouth in those two verses there. There's 39 books in the Old Covenant, by the way. God gave the law and man broke the law. That's what the whole Old Testament's all about. That's what the first Adam is all about. The second Adam is there's one that kept the law. There's one that was deceived. There, that, there was one that, I have said there's one that was deceived. There was one who was tempted in the new covenant, in the new testament, yet without sin. And he lives forever. And so here's the word of God given to Adam. The devil then comes in as Monsanto. Now he is going to try to genetically alter what God said. Yea, hath God said. Then he goes into altering all of that. 46 words here, Genesis chapter 3 in your King James Bible. So think about it. Here, God, here's God's seed, and it's incorruptible. And that's how we're born again, by incorruptible words. Then here comes the devil with corruptible words, and he says these corruptible words. He's, he's like Creflo Dollar, or he's Kenneth Copeland, or he's Joel Osteen, or he's Rick Warren, or he's Sid Roth, or he's Jim Staley, or he's in any of these other false teachers and false gospel producers. They come in with corrupt words. And they sow those corrupt words in people's minds and hearts, whereas here was someone who was on track to believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ, 
Now the corrupt words have gone in and reprogrammed their thinking. And now, as the case of the Hebrew Roots people, you're back now uh, at Mount Sinai thinking that Jesus was pointing backward to Mount Sinai when really it's Moses pointing forward to Jesus. And you're back at Mount Sinai, and now you're under the curse to do everything that the law says, or you will die and spend eternity dead in the lake of fire, the second death. You see how it works? Now it makes sense now, doesn't it? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And I, and you guys know what I think. I think if my Bible is not... If my Bible is not pure and whole and has every word in every place that God wanted it, then this book is corrupted seed and the birthing that takes place as a result of this book, that birthing will be corruptible as well. You're either going to be born, you're either going to have a thought process born in your mind that is based upon incorruptible seed. Therefore, that thought process is going to be, nobody, nobody can change it. Or somebody comes along with corrupted words, bad words, and they say these things to you, and now you believe what they say. Now you have a, you have a new birth, but it's corrupt. Job 14.4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one, he says. Go look that up, Job 14.4. Awesome verse. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. So let's go back to the Bible. If my Bible is, if my Bible is unclean, if it has mixtures of error in it, if there's a word that shouldn't be there that's there or a word that should be there that's not there, or if it hasn't been, if there are words in here that are not translated the right way according to the Hebrew and the Greek, if there are omissions in here, or if there are additions in here, or if God has something else for us outside of the Bible, this is not complete, then this is an unclean thing. And can I be can I be born of this unclean book? Can I have a clean birth out of this book? The answer is no. You see where, see where I'm going? And, and this is why I, I just had this idea. False Bible, salvation, being born again. You're either going to be born again. Of, and and here's, here's what I think is going to happen. I think in the future, in the not-too-distant future, I think that mankind is going to have a rebirth. Human 2.0, the transhuman movement, the immortality movement, the um, hybrid movement, man being a hybrid of technology and biology. I think mankind is going to have a rebirth whereby that new creature that is born as a result of that is going to be, number one, substantially different than what you and I are right now. But because it was rebirthed of corrupted seed, that birth is corrupt, and it won't last. It will perish. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one. James chapter 3, verse 11. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Or either a vine, figs? Now, let's stop right here. Let's stop right here. We live in the 20th, 21st century. We live in a time when it's going to be possible that they can get fig figs to grow on olive branches by genetic alteration. Can the fig tree bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. 
You can't do it. You cannot go to a, a, a river or a stream or any kind of waterway in the, in the world and find salt water on one half of the stream and fresh water on the other. It'll never happen. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He said you shall know them by their what? By the fruit. Remember? God is not mocked whatsoever. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever ye sow, that shall ye also reap. And so the false prophets are out there. And they're dressed like sheep. How can we tell whether or not they're telling the truth or not? How can we tell whether or not their doctrine is true? How can we tell if they're wolves? Wait for the fruit to come out. That's all you got to do. And God, God makes it even so easy for us so that when you hear, uh, who is it? Um, you hear um, Brian, um, Brian McLaren one of the emergent church leaders who is trying to reinvent God for everybody. When you hear Brian McLaren talking about how he participated in his son's sodomite wedding, you can say, that's the vine of Sodom right there. I know that for a fact. That is, in fact, that's, that's easy. The fruit that comes as a result of Brian McLaren's doctrine and his ideas and his teaching is not the true vine of Jesus Christ. It's the vine of Sodom because the fruit that comes out is he's endorsing and participates in his sodomite son's sodomite wedding. It's that simple. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you people, it's getting easier and easier and easier for God's real people to discern that a church or a pastor or a ministry has been drawing from the vine of Sodom rather than the true vine of Jesus Christ because more and more and more churches, more and more uh, ministries, more and more religious figures are endorsing sodomite wedding, sodomite relationships. Let's be friendly to gay day here at such and such church, such and such worship center, and it becomes obvious that the vine that they are from is not the vine of Jesus Christ. It's the vine of Sodom. So he says, you shall know them by their fruits. Matthew 7, 16, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And think about that word thorn. What did God curse the ground with? Thorns. What happens when good seed is sown into ground where there is an abundance of thorns? The thorns come in and choke out the word. See, that's, that's all you're waiting to see. You're waiting to see the fruit that is produced or the lack thereof. Or figs of thistles. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Listen to me. And this, this will help you. I believe this is a good tree. In fact, it's the best. This tree and the DNA encoded in this tree is perfect. It's right, it's just, it's clean, it's wholesome, it's pure. And I want you to understand that this, this will be a blessing to you. You came as a lost, wicked, vile, corrupt, perverted, uh, deceitful, filthy sinner, and you tried to change yourself, and you tried to change yourself, and you were told that if you think good thoughts, then that's going to change everything in your life, and you tried the good thoughts thing, but every time you thought a good thought, there was a really, really bad, nasty one just eating it up, and it wasn't working, and finally you came to the clean, pure, holy, unleavened Word of God. And you threw yourself in the arms of Jesus and you humbled yourself before the cross of Jesus Christ 
and Christ spoke his wholesome words into your life, into your heart, and he planted a good seed in you, and you've never been the same since then. And here's what I'm telling you. Don't worry so much about what you think you do or don't do. You concentrate on this book and what it says and believe what it says and receive what it says, and then all of a sudden, God will start doing the stuff in you and through you. Can I get an amen out of God? I don't even have my, my mule here. I just have to make an amen. That's good. That's the living word of God. That book's got power. That book will produce. That tree is going to produce good fruit. The, the tree produces the fruit. The fruit does not produce itself. So every good tree bringeth good, forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And I've, I've, I've seen one of these. I used to know a guy out in the country. He had a bunch of cows out in the field, and he had this pear tree. And he said, come out here and look at this. And he pulled a pear down out of the tree. They weren't quite ripe yet, but he pulled this pear out and showed it to me. And man, I tell you what, this pear was messed up. It didn't have a pear-shaped figure at all. It was it looked just weird. It just had dents and holes and stuff in it. I mean, didn't really look much like a pear. And I went, what is this? He said, it's a pear. I said, that looks terrible. He, I said, can you eat them? He said, oh, Lord, no. He said, you can't eat them. He said, they're terrible. And he said, this tree every year puts out these bad pears. And I said, what is it good for? He said, well, watch this. He went to shaking the tree, and pears began to fall out of it. Here come the cows. He said, the cows love them. They eat them up. But he said, they're no good. That's cr-. And I, for the first time in my life, I'm looking at a corrupt tree. I'm looking at a tree that brings forth fruit, but it's bad. It's, you can't eat it. It looks terrible. For the first time in my life, I'm start, God, God wanted me to see that that day, to understand what a bad tree is. And so think about it. He said a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So here's what they're trying to tell you. They're trying to tell you that they can put a bed on the stage in the church house and talk lascivious, and that's going to bring people to Jesus Christ. Not happening. They're trying to tell you that they can sing worldly rock and roll songs in their church service, during the worship service, and that's going to bring people to Jesus Christ, and they are wrong. These churches... These ministries, they are, they are, number one, they're drawing from the vine of Sodom, which is nothing but pure poison. And here, if we had take this in Matthew 7, 15, apply it to what we see in Deuteronomy 32 and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, we see that there is no way in the world that the vine of Sodom ever produces good grapes. Never happens. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, which according to some people is a little place on this corner of heaven, according to some people, not the Bible, is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by your fruits, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, the Bible tells us, judge not lest you be judged. I get that. But it also says, with whatever judgment you pass on somebody else, that's the judgment that's going to be given to you. Now, while I would say that it's probably a bad idea to judge people upon one or two things that you see coming out of their lives, because after all, we're all messed up in some way or another. There, you, there are people out there who watch me who think that I'm the worst heretic that ever walked inside a pair of tennis shoes because there's something that I say that they don't agree with. And I'm not saying that we just go around and try to look for everybody that's wrong or bad. What I'm saying to you is all of us in some way are going to be wrong about an issue or two. God's going to make sure it's that way because he's the only one who tells the truth all the time. We don't. 
But what I'm telling you is, is that you just kind of watch people. You may have your suspicions at first, but, you know, maybe God's got them in the wilderness so he can bring them out and he's going to set them in a good place like he did with me and like he did with a lot of you. Can I hear God's people say amen? Amen. But just wait a while. Because at some point, the fruit of what they sowed is going to come out. And we'll look at that and say, now I know. Now I know. So that's, that's the issue, whether it's, in, whether it's dealing with DNA, whether it's dealing with what churches do and how churches do and what they say and what comes out of them. Let me show you this. Let me um, see if I can pull this up here. There it is. Here we go. I want you to take a look at these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We all understand that. That's what we talked about earlier. Now watch this. 2 Timothy 2.16. Think about Monsanto now. Think about Monsanto, and they have, um, they have some DNA from a soybean or some corn or wheat or rice, rice with human DNA in it, and they don't like the words that are in that book of DNA. And so they're going to, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33, they're going to send in evil communications in order to corrupt the good book or the good words and the fruit of those words. They're going to go in and alter that with other words. So you think about that. He said, but shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word, you see it? See it? Think of, think of, think of a sermon. Think of, um, <laughs> think of a Patricia King video, or a Joyce Myers one, or a Beth Moore, or Sid Roth, or any of these other wackos. Think of their sermons. Think of what they say. Their word. Think of Monsanto who thinks they figured out how to make soybeans instead of them being this big, they're this big. And you can make a lot more soy sauce out of these than you can these. Think about it. Their word, in fact, let me go back. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will do what? Increase unto more ungodliness. What is Monsanto wanting to do with corn and, and rice and wheat and Pigs and chickens want to make them bigger. They want to want, want more of them too, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Uh, Facebook posts. Shun profane and vain Facebook postings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. There's some people you probably need to unfriend. Get them off. You know why? Because every time something comes up, they put you in a foul mood. I've had to do that. I've had to unfriend and block some people on Facebook because everything they put up put me in a bad mood. I had to, I had to do it. Anyway, their word will eat as doth a canker. That word canker and the word cancer, they're the same. And what you know what the word canker means? Something that eats. Oh, look there. It's right there in the scripture. Their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. The truth is the word of God. The truth is the original rice DNA. That's the truth. Thy word is truth. It's 
as true as God put it in that rice and in that apple and in that cow and in that pig and in that chicken and in that catfish. It's as true as how God put it in there because it's the original. And here's what they do. They err concerning the truth. They go in and take out the truth and replace it with something else that doesn't belong there. Now there's an error in it. They err concerning the truth. By the way, here's another way they do it. Well, I believe all the translations have errors in it. That's They have erred concerning the truth. They think that there is no way that a translation of the Bible can be right 100% of the time, even though God said, hey, I speak in other languages. Of course, do not interpretations belong to God? Didn't I do that, you know, that little translating all the tongues things out there in the day of Pentecost? Isn't that one of the spiritual gifts is interpretation of unknown tongues? Of course I do this. According to the truth, their word will lead us to the canker who concerning the truth have erred. And so Paul is warning. They've got words. And those words are going to come at you. And the intention of those words is going to be to alter the words that I gave you. I'll give you an example. In in 1 John, oh, excuse me, not 1 John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, and here's where the Jehovah's Witness will come in, and they'll knock on your door, and you'll say, hey, now wait a minute here. The Word is Jesus, and he's God. And they'll open up their Bible, and they'll say, no, in the original Greek, it says, and the word was a God, little g. All they have to do is add a letter. And they've demoted Jesus from being the most high God, from being Jehovah, from being God Almighty, the everlasting Father. They've demoted with one letter in a sentence. They've demoted Christ from being the superior Almighty God to a lesser God like an angel. That's all they did. One letter. But that one letter increases unto more ungodliness, and it eats as doth a canker. And you know what it does? It eats away all the other good words. Because now, here's, here's what happened. Now, because they planted in your mind the idea that your Bible isn't right in everything that it says. Then they come along with all their literature and all their books and videos and whatever it is, that, that whether it's Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons or whether it's the, uh, the, the sacred name people or the Hebrew Roots people or the emerging church people or whatever it is, now they come along with all of their stuff, all of their teachings, in order to show you all the other places in the Bible that they think are wrong. That's how it works. You've already, listen, your DNA is exactly the way God wrote it out. Even with, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm a little overweight. Okay. Now, in my younger years, I was as slim as a mop handle. You know what? My dad, in his younger years, was slim and tall as a mop handle. He was six foot seven, weighed about 180 pounds, soaking wet. Man, he was a bean pole back then. But then, as he grew into his adult years, he put on weight, and they called him Big Youngin for a reason. I'm just following in the footsteps of my dad, not deliberately. It's just that's how my body is. When I was young, I was slim and slender. And as I got into maturity, I'm a big fella. But I'm not looking to change and alter my DNA. No way. I'll live with it. I'll deal with it until the Lord comes back and that good seed that he sowed in me. I know the creature that's going to come out of that. And I can't wait for it. So think about this now. Let's go back to this. Changing the embryo. Changing the DNA of the embryo. And remember I said, the baby is going to be born substantially different than how it was conceived. Did you catch that? You ponder that and think about 
the religious ramifications of that, okay? Let's look at another verse. Let's look at Genesis just 3, 1. We've already talked about that. I want to move on. He used words. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He used words. His words ate as doth a canker. The devil used words against Jesus in Matthew, in the Gospels, and those words didn't work. He had a shield, and he fended them off, and he used Scripture to turn against those, those corrupt words. But Eve fell for it. And in 2 Corinthians eleven three, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So here is the devil And he's not using magic tricks. He's not calling down signs and wonders from heaven. He's speaking words. Speaking words. And now all of a sudden, Eve's mind is corrupted by his subtlety. Let me, um, permit me for a minute to use an illustration like this. And I know, a, I know a minister, a preacher. There's been a bunch of them. And I've talked about him, and I love him, and I've been praying for him. He went around the country preaching about godly marriage and having godly homes and how to turn off the television and don't watch filth and don't listen to country music and don't listen to all this other music out there. It increases into ungodliness. And he was caught. He was caught with this other woman. See, here's what happened. His wife is telling him, honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. I thank God for us being together. And that was in his mind. And then another woman came and said, Oh, I love you. And the other woman's words corrupted the words of his wife in his mind. And he got caught. See how it works? And, and, and I've said this before and I'll say it again. If I, if I can convince you by something I say that the King James is right and all the other translations are wrong, somebody else can come in after me and talk you back out of it. Because my words, they're nothing. The only thing that I want you to do is be awakened to the Word of God. Because if you will let the Word of God go into you and find good ground in your life, it will bring forth the fruit. But you got to watch out. Because there's always going to be somebody who's going to use words to try to corrupt your mind from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, and I've made this statement too. Think about this, that ISIS has caught some more Christians, I guess, marched them out, cut their heads off. You remember those, those, uh, what was the Egyptian Coptic Christians? Now, I'm not a big fan of the Coptic church. It's sort of Catholic light. I don't think that's right. But according to what I heard, the last word that came out of some of these men's mouth was Jesus. You know what I believe? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I also know that Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which was in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. I think there's some guys that got their head cut off. I think I'm going to see them in heaven. You know why? Because I believe in the simplicity in Christ. 
So watch this. The simplicity is whosoever should call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The, the simplicity is we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. I believe God can save me and God's the only one that can save me. I believe that whatever I do down here on this world is never going to be good enough to earn my salvation and God saves me. Why? Because I trust him. And he's the only one that I'm trusting for my salvation. See how simple that is? And I would say, watch out for Sid Roth and Perry Stone and the whole Hebrew Roots gang who are trying to convince you that it's not that simple. That in order to really be saved and really have the blessings of God, you've got to go and learn Hebrew, and you've got to go and study the law and try to do as much of that as possible in order to really be saved. See what they did? They corrupted people's minds from the simplicity that is in Christ. And how did they do it? Words. They used words in order to do it. By the way, if you want to, go listen to it. Go find Jim Staley's talk on, let's say, the book of Galatians. First of all, what I want you to do is read the book of Galatians. Now, I'm going to back up. I can't recommend this to everybody because there are some who are weak in the faith, and they may be convinced otherwise. But those of you who are strong in the faith, go read Galatians, the entire book, and understand that Paul teaches salvation by grace through faith. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And it's that simple. That's it right there. That's all you need to know out of it. And that anything else is witchcraft. And then go listen to Jim Staley, his discussion or his teaching on the book of Galatians. Jim Staley will have you convinced that Paul, what Paul really said was you need to go keep the law in order to be saved. 180 degree difference from what the book of Galatians and the King James actually says. And here comes Jim Staley's words, and he, you figure out how he works, he doesn't like the King James Bible. He doesn't. He does not like that version of the Bible. He'll pick a version that is, to me, to him, less offensive Because really what he's going to do at the end, he's going to subvert the whole thing anyway and rewrite it. He's going to do what Monsanto does with rice. He's going to take out those pagan Roman, Greco-Roman pagan ideas out of the English translation, and he's going to insert the, the Jewish perspective into it. You remember the Jews who killed Jesus, didn't know who he was, and they're half blind. And they worship idols. They worship a God that is not the God of their fathers. That's what he does. He's like Monsanto. He doesn't like what he sees, so he he rearranges it. He edits it. He changes it. He's like the, the Chinese geneticists who are able to go in at the embryonic level and alter the DNA to make it turn out in their favor how they want it, and that's what, these, that's what he and all these other people do. They will rewrite, rearrange, alter, change, put a word here, take a word out here in order for it to say what they want you to think it says. The Swaggart Expository Bible or whatever it's called. It's 2 Thessalonians 2. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. The Swaggarts don't believe that that's how it's going to happen. So they don't like how the King James is translated. So they go in with different words and they actually put it in the text and say, this really should be translated being caught away. So really what the verse really should say is that day won't come except the catching away takes place first. Now it says what they want them to say. And they did exactly what the Chinese geneticists did. They went right into the seed itself and altered it. So now what's born bears no resemblance to what was conceived. This is how they work, people. This is, how they, this is the plan. This is what's going on. 
He said, how much more time do I have? I got a little time. Acts 13.10. And said, this is, this is uh, Saul or Paul. This, here's the transition chapter, Acts chapter 13. He goes from Saul to Paul in this chapter. And Paul said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. I have an idea for a watchman called Son of Belial. I don't know how it's going to come out yet, but it's a pretty, pretty, pretty good idea. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Again, take this and put it on a a DNA level. You could say that the seed companies are the child of the devil because they will not cease perverting the right ways of God in the DNA of those seeds. And I'm, I'm not talking about normal hybrid seeds, because after all, the corn that you and I eat on a cob has actually has been developed. I think it was developed by some tribes down in South America, if I remember right. But the corn that you and I eat now didn't exist a thousand years ago. I think that's how it works. You go look that up, make sure I'm right. But what happened was what they, they, they crossed certain things, which, you know, is done a lot. Even us, we're a wild vine or wild branch put on the, put on the olive tree, and they develop corn this way. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about that. What I'm talking about is them going in and rewriting the DNA of it. And the seed companies do not cease to pervert the right ways of rice when they take rice and add human DNA to the rice. When pigs are being genetically modified with human DNA, cows likewise, and on and on and on, These companies do not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. Neither do the false teachers, the false prophets, the Bible correctors, and all of that other crowd who will not just let the Bible be the Bible. They will not just let it say what it has to say. They've got to pervert it, and they never stop. It's one sermon, and then it's another sermon. And what you're going to hear, every sermon is a Greek lesson. In the original Greek, it says this. In the original Hebrew, it says this. They will not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. Look at what Nebuchadnezzar was accusing his astrologers of. He said, if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. You have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. You see that? Till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Nebuchadnezzar had just about had it with his astrologers, his soothsayers, his Chaldeans. There's another group, and there's four groups in there. I remember that. You go study that. There's four groups that lied to Nebuchadnezzar, and there's four Hebrew men. Daniel, Hananiah, Hananiah, can't think of their names. Now, I drew a blank. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I got it! Those four were better than the other four. Isn't it cool? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is better than earth, air, fire, and water. Okay? That's how you, that's how you see that. But Nebuchadnezzar had had enough of his soothsayers lying to him, preparing lying and corrupt words. He'd had it. And so have a lot of you. Because you went, you've been on the net. You've been scouring the World Wide Web. You've been watching YouTube videos. And you were in this group for a while, and you were in that group for a while, and you followed this guy's teachings over here, and you did this over here. And you got tired of being lied to. And it wasn't satisfying. And you were just about to give up. Until the Holy Ghost said, read the King James Bible. So you said, sure, why not? Tried everything else. And you tasted to see if the Lord was good or not. And once you tasted, you went, oh, where have you been all my life? 
Daniel 7, 11, here's what it says about that beast. And I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verse 25, he shall speak great words against the most high. What's the most high? This right here. There's nothing higher than this. There's no authority higher than God's word, is there? None. There isn't a, a supervisory board that governs over all of Christianity that determines whether or not the Bible is right in any one case or not. There isn't that. There is to those who love the Lord and who love the Word, the Bible is the final authority. The Antichrist speaks great words against the Most High. Lying and corrupt words. In fact, here's something interesting to think about. I don't even know really what the depth of what it means. But think about this. Think about the ability that the Antichrist is going to have to understand dark sentences. And what are dark sentences? I have no idea. I know what light sentences are. Light sentences are, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Light sentences are, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Those are light words. Dark sentences, I think, would be the opposite of the Word of God. Think of it like this. If you know anything about Freemasonry, Freemasonry has what they call the lost word. And it's this idea that they, they tell this, this myth about Hiram Abiff, and Hiram Abiff had the secret to building temples. Think about that word. Think about what that means. He had the secret to building temples, and the three um, lower masons wanted his secret to possess it for themselves. And so they attacked Hiram Abiff, and they, wouldn't, they couldn't get the secret words out of him. And so... When he died, the word died with him. And they say it's, you know, one of many things. It's actually the secret name of God, or it's the secret word or secret thing that if you learn how to pronounce it, you can create and build temples and do all this stuff. I think my, my own feeling is, my gut feeling, and my guts have a lot of feelings, my gut feeling is that it has something to do with altering DNA. That's what I think. But the idea in masonry of the lost word, that lost word is the opposite of the revealed word, which is our Bibles. And masonry and and Manly Hall will tell you that that secret was lost. It's buried. It's in a crypt somewhere. It's down in a pit. And one of these days, though, it's going to be discovered and come out, and it's going to be the healing of the nations. It's going to give people, it's going to rebuild the temple. Think about it. The lost word of Freemasonry, I think, are going to be great words against the Most High. Dark sentences. Now, throw something else in here that only a few people will probably get this. If you've been hearing anything about uh, CERN and the Large Hadron Collider and what it is that they're trying to discover, the Higgs boson and the God particle and all this stuff. There is a theory now that exists around in the world that says that pervading all through the universe is something called dark matter. Have you ever heard that before? Dark matter. And it would be like the opposite of the matter that you and I have, this pen and this phone, that's all made of regular matter. They say there's like an opposite of that called dark matter. God's Word is what brought into existence all the things that you and I see and touch and feel and interact with in this world. And I think dark matter has something to do with those dark sentences and the lost word and so on. That's about as far as I can go with it because my mind just, I just, anyway, it's just a theory, something for you to think about. Anyway, 
back to this. Um, and we are going a little bit over time today because we got started late. All right. So I got about 10 minutes more to go here, but I want you to look at this. All right. Look at these verses here. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 2 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with, look at it, enticing words of man's wisdom. All these verses that I've been that I've been putting up here have to do with great words, great words against the Most High, uh, lying and corrupt words, uh, perverting the right ways of God, and the words that Satan spoke, and evil communications, and their cancer words, and so on. That's what every one of these verses has to do with. And how I came upon this was I just decided to look at all the places in the Bible where it said word or words. It's how simple that is. And Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. And I told the story about being at a conference, and I was telling people, when you hear these preachers start talking about a paradigm shift and, and, a, and a, you know, a higher consciousness and a great awakening and all this stuff, stay clear of that, because none of that is in the Bible, and they're using these new age techniques to lead you to something that is probably not of God. And I was doing a Q&A, a question and answer after that, and this young man raised his hand. He said, yeah, I heard you say that. He said, but let me tell you what I do. What I do is I go around and I talk to lost people, and I'm trying to bring them to salvation. And I use phrases like paradigm shift and a great awakening and a higher consciousness. And I, he said, I use things like that. And I said, why? He said, because that's, that's the words of this day. And he said, they can, they can you know, equate with that, and they kind of get along with that, what I'm telling them. And I said to him in front of everybody, what you're doing is not right. You're giving him man's words. You're not giving him God's word. God's word and God's word alone is what saves man to the uttermost, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. This young man was convinced that he was leading people to Jesus with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now, in his doctrine or in his church, they may have said, well, these people are saved. That's, that's it. That's all that matters. They came, they made a decision, and that's it. They're, they're in that may have been how they see it. And it's not really my place to judge, but you would have to ask the question, if somebody was brought to a conversion experience without the Word of God, were they saved? How can they be, how can they be born again if not by incorruptible seed? Romans 5, 6, let no man deceive you with, here it is, vain words. Vain words. You know what vain words are? Stuff that doesn't. See, they're using, they're using paradigm shift now. And back a few years ago, they were using things like, um, uh, what was it? Uh, what would Jesus do? And uh, the prayer of Jabez. And then before that, it was, I mean, who knows what it was. That every generation comes up with some new slang and some new terminology, and, and it's a fad, and it, you know, it's there for a while, then it goes away. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Words that have no long-term effect on you. And if they are not the incorruptible words of God, they will be vain words. They will be words that have a temporary impact on your life. And it's like me teaching you right now. Because I'm not interested that you go back after today's broadcast and listen to everything I said a few more times so that it sinks in. What I really care about is for you to take these verses that I've put up on the screen or ones that I've read and you to go to those verses and then draw a circle around them and read what came before and what came after that. That's what I want. That's what I think God wants. And it's my job. It's the job of the preacher to not replace God's words, but to awaken people to God's word. Because my words are vanity. 
God's words are everlasting. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these cometh the wrath of God upon the children of, look at here, look at here, children of disobedience. Remember, I was going to tell you, I was telling you that I'm thinking about doing a thing on the, um, the sons of Belial, children of Belial. Look at here, children of disobedience is another way of saying children of Belial. So, vain words that are meant to deceive people will bring upon the wrath of God upon those who have been born by them. I mean, look at what it says. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. If they come at you with vain words, more than likely, these words are going to cause you to disobey God's true eternal words. And when you do that, you're being born again of corruptible seed. Colossians 2, 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. You know what that is, don't you? That's the churches that put up billboards all over town that say, um, Overdrive Community Fellowship, four-week sermon series, Let's Talk Sex. And they put those billboards up all over town. Overdrive Community Center. I just came up with that. I guarantee you there's probably already a church out there called Overdrive Church or something like that. All right? Supercharged Church. And they play a lot of rock music. But they use enticing words. Creflo and Joyce and Kenneth and Finnis Dake and all of these others are using enticing words. They're enticing you through the lust of your flesh or the lust of your eyes. They'll tell you, go out and look at your neighbor's house. And if your neighbor's house is worth $250,000 more than your house, then bless God, you deserve to have your neighbor's house or you deserve to have one better. And they use little bitty snippets of scripture to try to prove to you that you should have more than what you have. They're using enticing words. Or they'll put up billboards, sleazy billboards or sleazy flyers or advertisements all over the place trying to get... And by the way, let's. I'm going to be as G-rated as possible at this, but this is what, and the Bible word is whore. This is what whores do. They use enticing words. Go back to the preacher and his mistress used enticing words on him. And that would be no different than anybody else, maybe even some that are listening to me, who you have an online chat friend, whether it's on Facebook or any of these others. I don't even know hardly anything outside of Facebook, but some of these other socially networking places, and you're having chats, even some of you ladies having chats with men and men having chats with women. And there's enticing words being mentioned there. Listen, go read Proverbs about three or four times because you'll realize that Mystery Babylon is laying a trap for you. And if you follow her, you're going to follow her right down to hell. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, or nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Flattering words, enticing words. Again, that's what whores use. I like being nice to people. I like saying nice things, and but it's my job every now and then to say things that sometimes we don't want to hear or it's going to make us uncomfortable. God says them to me first. 
and you need them. Watch those words, people. Watch those words. Don't let anybody beguile you and alter you and corrupt you with those words. That applies to preaching, YouTube videos, blogs, and it also applies to a future medicine that has a package of words in it that's meant to alter your book. Right? Good to be with you today. Uh, Keep David to me in your prayers and keep me in your prayers. There will be no PMO next week. We might we might rebroadcast some reruns of some things just to fill the time. Uh, but I'll be busy with doctor's appointments and getting ready for surgery on Thor's Day. And so I do appreciate your prayers. All right. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday morning preaching the word of God, singing the old hymns. And uh, anyway, God bless you. Think Bible.